Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the team here of the New Art School and Design the Ducks podcast. Our guest today is Adam Paxman. Welcome, Adam. Hi. Fantastic to have you here. Yes, thank you for having me. Fantastic. Very excited. <laughs> Fantastic. So tell us about you and your work. Um, I'm a, uh, a freelance illustrator, um, although I've taken a bit of a step back um, uh, the last year or so. And I'm now um, far more actively pushing um, some uh, self-publishing projects and publishing on demand projects, uh, illustrated books um, uh, based on uh, blogs that I've been uh, working on for uh, about 10 years, uh, 10, 11 years. Um, but yeah, I've, I've worked as a freelance illustrator sporadically uh, since 2008, but my, um, my main uh, career is as, um, uh, as a teacher, as a lecturer um, at a further, edu uh, further education college in um, the northwest of England um, that also delivers higher education uh, qualifications. Uh, and I, since 2013, I've worked exclusively in the, the higher education um, part of that um, part of that institution. Fantastic, fantastic. So, what are your latest projects? Um, my latest um, personal projects um, uh, involve. Um, I'm currently editing together. I think I'm on about page eighty of a, a publishing on demand book. Um, based on the blogs I mentioned. Um, they're a very kind of um, misanthropic, cynical, sarcastic uh, stab at um, the absurdity of, of the human condition. And, and I, looking back over them and editing some of the ones from 2009, 2010, I realized how angry, how, how angry I was as a, as a younger man um, and how far I've uh, come in those years. Um, uh, but in terms of um, research output uh, and things like that, I think um, I was originally considering um, answering a call for papers this year um, for uh, design education, uh, talking about um, different paradigms. Um, and uh, then um, lockdown hit and COVID-19 hit. And uh, I thought, well, I, if I put something in about... Um, digital learning and, and, and teaching, that could be quite unique. And then, of course, lockdown and COVID has gone on and on. And I think everyone has had to scramble to learn uh, uh, the new normal and the new normal for, for teaching. Um, uh, other than that, I'm, um, I've been writing a little bit more than, uh, than uh, I have for a little while, um, just recently in, in, in lockdown. Um, and uh, I've submitted some short fiction to um, an online publication called Speculative Fictions. Uh, I've been chatting to the editor um, for that, um, which has been really nice because uh, social contact is currently so um, up and down um, and few and far between. And um, also, um, I've really found that I've been going, uh, sort of regressing into myself, into a kind of core version of myself and really thinking about nostalgia and childhood and because I'm a new father as well I think this this has all been on my mind this year and I'm thinking about there's something bubbling up there that I might like to do whether it's a publishing project or uh, but dealing with um, what Simon Pegg referred to a few years ago as the infantilization of our generation um, uh, and 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 that sort of drive that, that that especially geeks like me have to collect um, and and so some of those sort of, sort of Freudian or Jungian um, ideas around around collecting and um, there's something there I think that's that's quite interesting um, uh, yeah and um, so uh, for a few years I've been sort of jobbing um, academic just res responding to calls for papers as and when they pop up and. And tickle my fancy. Um, so I've ended up doing some quite diverse things. Um, and yeah, I think that's, oh uh, yeah, and a, a sci-fi zine. I'm, I'm going to work on a sci-fi zine as well with a, with a new friend, which is really nice. It's nice to make new friends in lockdown. Um, uh, a lady named Steph, she's a um, uh, she's a friend of a friend who I've known for years, but not really known very well at all. Sort of a face at a party here and there. 
and then um, we got chatting as mutual friends, and we decided to we decided to do something um, with a really kind of old school kind of sci fi fanzine um, aesthetic um, to it, and we're just kind of working through some ideas. Um, so yeah, I've got I've got a few things on. I think when you list it like that, I don't feel as lazy as maybe I sometimes um, worry that I am. <laughs> <laughs> you have been quite a prolific blogger over over the years. Uh, yes, yeah, I've I've written over two, over three hundred short stories in about a decade, um, and um, as I said, like with with that book project, some of the editing that I'm doing is actually really revisiting language. Mm. That's become a really interesting thing because language has actually moved on so much in 10 years because of internet cultures and because of um, uh, sort of internet consensus around um, different equality and diversity issues. Um, and I, I used to be known at work as Mr. E&D, Mr. Equality and Diversity, for some talks I did. And I am very passionate about equality and diversity in, in, in all of its forms. Mm. I've worked with some fa um, fantastic um, feminists um and vegans and uh people over the years uh the last few years and um i'm just constantly learning i think the black lives matter uh movement um that's come to light recently um has really made me also in a very genuine way um uh really reflect on my upbringing and my education and my childhood and what i should be doing as an educator better uh, and doing more of or doing less of um, and so going back and editing that, that work from um, around 10 years ago has given me an opportunity to really kind of um, do some addenda, addendums that are, uh, that are funny, but also some that are a little bit more heartfelt. And I think I really need to make sure that it's clear at the start of the book with an introduction that there's Adam Paxman and there's Mr. Paxman, there's fictional version of him uh, that's way more sort of ruthless and cutthroat. Um, <laughs> um, and I think also, um, I think a really important thing um, in, terms of, in terms of that, I've been very, obviously, I think, very reflective uh, in this period. Um, about my myself and as, as I said I've got a young son and it's really changed literally changed my brain architecture according to according to the internet um, when I've looked it up but um, <laughs> uh, it really has changed my um, attitudes and opinions on um, on, on things um, and yeah I just uh, I, I was doing a project um, a year or so back for a symposium a conference uh, at Worcester, and unfortunately, the timing ended up just not not working out for um, a collaboration that I was going to do um, with a with a, a very talented um, illustration lecturer friend of mine, and um, they'd okayed uh, a talk that I was going to give, and I'd already started to um, I started to make models. Um, I was I was at a bit of an impasse. Um, I was I was I, I suffer from depression, um, and this was on mental health. Um, and illustration and how illustration can be used um, in various settings, including design and education, illustration education, um, uh, to deal with that. And um, so it allowed me to really kind of um, think about since to, uh, 2017, when I was diagnosed, really to, to look back to my teens when I first started having um, real bouts of depression. And also every day, just these um, these sensations that I was having that I now recognize um, anxiety um, and um, yeah so it allowed me to really play with that and give it a face like literally give it a face personify and anthropomorphize um, some stress and some anxiety and some depression and then unfortunately it kind of fell through so I've got um, I've got some really interesting uh, models that I made that haven't seen the light of day anywhere so I suppose I should do something with those in the future I'll put a pin in that one and return to it, um, yeah, at some point. Absolutely, you're one of those uh, uh, rare artists that is also very comfortable with, with with writing. So your illustrations and writing, you you are quite comfortable with, yes. Yeah, I um, I've always enjoyed writing. I've always enjoyed um, creative writing, and I really enjoy academic writing. Mm -hmm. I like um, I, I like the tone of voice that you strike with academic writing, and it's something that crosses over into the fictional writing. Um, quite often, I sort of go all over the map in terms of um, using 
quite formal language, um, and then that'll set up a sort of punchline where I use far more uh, informal or slang expressions. Mm-hmm. And I am just really interested in, yeah, the development of language and and, um, and how that can relate to semiotics, for example. I, you know, I teach a lot of stuff about semiotics and science. So, um, yeah, I, I think it all it all comes from a point of um, a sort of uh, cosmic wonder uh, and, and a sort of joy and uh, horror at the absurdity of the cosmos. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about your journey into teaching. Um, I, I got a job, uh, a part-time job, at a college library um, when I was doing my uh, part-time master's degree. I was doing that in Exum at what was called the North East Wales Institute, NUI, which is now Glendower. Um, and it was a very much um, a, a traditional art school set up. Um, I was kind of, I suppose, headhunted um, at my, um, my BA um, uh, degree show by the, the course leader. It was a brand new course. It was illustration for children. Again, something I want to go into. Um, and um, so um, when I got the job as a, as a librarian there, um, that without any sort of um, any idea other than, yes, I would all, I know I would also like to teach at higher education level uh, when I've got my master's, that being the only qualification you, you sort of needed at that point. Um, uh, I then, um, just to make more money, I, I got um, a, a job as an academic support worker. So I, for, for several years, I worked with um, students with autism, Asperger's, dyslexia, dyspraxia, um, some profoundly disabled um, students in, in classes on daily living skills, um, and worked alongside some fantastic um, lecturers in um, college level, FE level, um, art and design programs and um, a graphic arts program. Um, and uh, the, back then, the, the college paid for um, a, a PGCE or a Cert Ed. Um, and so I actually applied to, to do that as a natural progression um, into teaching. I think that was, I think, my, I think the first class I took, I'd, I'd done a couple of guest lectures before that at John Moore's, my old uh, alma mater. Um, but um, I think my first class was in 2009 and I just loved it and I really took to it. And um, uh, I think a key thing with my teaching is empathy. I do, I sort of talk about empathy a lot, but I talk about empathy in relation to design a lot as well. The importance of empathy um, for a designer to have, you know, um, thinking about um, a target audience sounds very dry, but when you think about them as, as genuine human beings with, emotions and 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 siblings and um and, and life experiences then you start to recognize that um, what what empathy really is and how how central it is to 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 what any designer does um unless you're designing uh, rabbit hutches i guess um and um yeah so i i became um, a further education lecturer i met my wife while doing my um pgce she was in the same class oh sorry no we were both support workers we met then and um but then we were doing the that we really kind of got together while we were both teachers and students which sounds gross and wrong um i think ross geller's faculty would frown on it um <laughs> in france but um yeah we got together very quietly and um uh so so yeah working at the college has really had a you know, fundamental shift in, in terms of my life and my um, my career direction and everything else. Um, and then um, a new um, a new head of school or whatever they were called back then, director was brought in um, for the creative arts areas, and um, and she had uh, she she was tasked with or she really pushed the idea of um, a university center um on on campus a dedicated building um and for us to run higher education courses and i was sort of on the the, uh, on the front line of that with with some other um colleagues and um it was 
it was magic. It was it was fantastic. Um, it really felt like oh, that's you know that that's brilliant to be able to set up a course like that. It um, was validated through um, the University of Central Lancashire. Um, so we're a partner college of the University of Central Lancashire. Did you, did you apply for awarding powers? Um, they haven't. The college hasn't done that. I believe gradually they are they are uh, intending to. Um, so uh, we're given. Uh, well, we went through a whole validation process and a panel. Um, I'm comfortable talking and yammering on, obviously. Um, so I think they thought I was useful in uh, in that kind of setting. Um, but also, um, yeah, it was just a beautiful thing to be able to work with those colleagues um, that I'd worked with for a few years at that point um, in in college level to be able to then see a progression for those uh, for those students, but also for for other students to bring in externally. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues, Andy Jones, he's worked. Uh, sorry, he 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 also um, did the degree I did, but a few years before me. So we we really had a um, similar you know education from a from a HE point of view. Um, and my other colleague, um, Shirley Brown, she was sort of homegrown by the college, if you like. Um, and um, we we really complement each other as a as a tripod. Um, very different skill sets very different interests. They hate the theory and the writing uh, modules, um, you know, like um, Peter Cushing style backing away. Um, I, uh, whereas I'm, I'm very much the, uh, the Christopher Lee. I you know, stand there and say, welcome to the lecture and please sit down and you're going to love theory and some, some of the students do and, and some of them don't. But uh, yeah, that's the best I can maybe hope for. <laughs> um, so yeah, since 2013, exclusively higher education, um, initially um, with the graphic arts programme, but then I've done, because I've gone more and more into contextual studies, um, uh, I've, I've, I now work with uh, creative makeup design and practice, uh, fashion and textiles, uh, visual merchandising and promotional design uh, and, and the graphics courses um, all uh, and in the last two years uh, all of them have had lectures um, that are you know sort of fundamentally design based um, together um, outside of that I also do teach some practical um, modules um, last year I've, I've done some um, teaching again with a, a year zero course um, so like a year uh, a level three course um, that, that leads into the, the our degree courses. Um, and I've done, um, yeah, I've done contextual, mainly I think contextual studies um, has been the thing I think of as my day job um, uh, and takes up most of my sort of time. And I think, again, that's what I said before about cosmic wonder and I'm constantly thinking about design and I'm constantly interested to hear people's opinions on design and ideas about design and read about design. So uh, contextual study sort of makes the most sense um, as well as me enjoying writing and being able to proofread. <laughs> so uh, over the past uh, 20 years or so, or even more, we have uh, witnessed uh, a shift uh, in, uh, in in art and design education, so and if you if there were no limitations, if if there was some way that you had no limitations, how, what would you do in, in in design education? What would you change or keep or remove completely? Um, I think um, it's a really interesting question. I I, I wrote a visual essay uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and I said that theory is really important because I think at that point um, it was coming under attack um, for, for in some in American institutions um, that said um, it should only really have sort of practical um, uh, teaching um, should learn you know learn a skill push a pencil um, uh, and I, I really came out um, at the gate with that I just said you know I hand on heart you know I love I love um, I love theory and I think it's really important because I don't think you can understand your practice and the practice of others without theory. Um, uh, but also it's that wider awareness of, um, of culture and society, um, the history of design, um, really providing genuinely providing context, um, for what, for what we do as designers. Um, so I think, I think that's important. I think there needs to be some recognition of theory as a really important part of, 
of the university experience. I think um, often with design education, it's maybe viewed as as like, oh, and then you do that lecture over there. You go and, you know, you have a seminar, you talk about some stuff, you do an essay or something. But mainly you're in the workshop, you're in the studio, you're doing these things. So I think, I think, um, I don't know how you would do it. It would need, I think design education needs to start earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, my, I'm, I'm 37, 38 in a couple of weeks. And I wasn't told what design was when I was at school. Um, it was uh, at college that I, uh, before I went to university, that I really started to get an understanding of design. Um, we did a bit of art history in school, which a lot of schools don't do now. Um, uh, I learned how to analyze an artwork when I was in school. And, and that's something that I do with my students now. I, um, I, I really sort of build um, different models and resources for how to um, break down an artwork in lots of different ways or break down a, a piece of design in lots of different ways and place it in context. Um, I think that needs to, to come back or to, to be sort of centered. Um, from a practical point of view, I always remember a friend of mine, Ed, um, he did multimedia when, uh, when, when that was a, a phrase that was bandied around. Um, uh, he's, he's a really successful um, uh, animator and creator of um, uh, uh, marketing um, projects like a, on huge scale now, but um, he does 3D design um, and 3D environments and things. Um, and, and he said a few years ago when I was chatting to him and a, and a mutual friend, um, and we would constantly talk about design whenever we get together over a beer um, because we were all at university together. And, uh, and that's like the thing that, you know, sort of binds us all together. It's the force. It's the in Star Wars. It's the force. The design is the force. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he said like one of the key things that he wasn't taught when, when he was at university was um, like how to actually create an artwork or a piece of design for it to then be mass produced by a, by a printer, to speak to a printer, um, to, uh, to format, to, to understand dimensions, all of that side of things. I thought that's, that's really a fundamental um, part of it. And, and, and that really chimed when, um, when we were writing what parts of the course we wrote um, uh, in 2013. We, we really did embed, it was a very conscious effort to embed employability skills um, into this and to have sort of real world usable knowledge and, and awareness of, of, um, uh, of, of what needs to be done sort of um, day to day. Um, Andy, my, my colleague, does a lot of work with um, um, sort of careers aspects um, on the course. And, uh, you know, that's really important to, to understand that it's not just three years. It's, it's it, you know, a, a, and it's art school in a very kind of old, old school art school way of, oh, it's, it's three years of art school. And it's like in a bubble. It's actually a launch pad for, an, you know, something that really sets, is supposed to set you off um, and, and prepare you. I, I personally didn't feel very well prepared for industry when I, when I did my, my BA. I think that's probably why I went straight on and did a master's. So I think, I think we need... We need to be industry focused, and I know there are dangers to that because it can it can be seen as attacking creativity um, uh, and that sort of open mindedness that you want from a, from an, uh, an educational establishment dealing with uh, design and creative um, endeavors. But I think it, the, the ind- making people ready for industry makes sense, and making people aware of the world of design. The universe of design is really important as well. So maybe those two things, I guess. Fantastic. I mean, the idea that a graduate is ready for industry uh, mm. is a relatively new one. I think if you speak to an older design, an old designer, they'll, they'll say to they'll say to you that after the graduation, you had another kind of a three-year apprenticeship. Yes, um, I, I spoke to. Um, sorry, sorry. Sorry, I butted it. Um, sorry, um, <laughs> I was at a degree show um, a few years ago, and I was speaking to um, Peter Bailey, who's this phenomenal illustrator um, and who used to work at John Moore's. And um, I, I didn't, I wasn't taught by Peter, but he was um, he was around occasionally, um, 
and um, we used to chat and I'd, I'd sort of see him every year and say hello. And he was, he was, he was such just like, like a real gentleman. And um, he was always really complimentary about my work of, um, of what he'd seen of it. And um, I remember saying, oh, you know, I was, you know, this is, you know, middle of this decade, maybe. Oh, I'm getting a bit, you know, I'm, I'm think, feeling a bit trapped and trying to move on to this or that. I'm trying to do more with the illustration. And he just went, oh, you're still young. Don't worry about it. You know, it, there, there is this, you know, like lifelong learning thing, but there's also, you know, the, the career thing of a, a lifelong career. Um, yeah, I think, I think I've always felt, um, I think, you know, if, if there are students watching or other educators or practitioners, they, you know, maybe they'll, some of them will feel this as well, um, but it might be just my anxiety talking. But I always felt like a bit of a failure as, a, as, as an actual practitioner trying to do commercial work. Um, I think that's maybe, I've always had the, the publishing thing in the back of my mind and I now, now push that to the fore because I think that's what I'm meant to do, if, if you will. Um, I just think a lot of my illustration, I can, I can follow a brief and but it's not necessarily my, my favorite thing to do. Um, and uh, yeah, and trying to balance all of that with, um, with a steady nine to five job of, um, of, of you know, design educator is, is very tricky as well. Indeed. Fantastic. So how can our viewers and listeners find you? Um, that's that's an excellent question um it's a sort of treasure hunt online <laughs> um i i have a, a website adampaxman.com and i'll i'll make sure i update it um <laughs> soon um uh with so cause some of the projects i've mentioned on the podcast here um i haven't actually um put up and and, and i can put some highlights from some of the the, the more interesting visually interesting research that i've done in the last few years academic stuff um uh, so yeah, adampaxman.com. I am, I think, all lowercase Mr. Paxman um, on Instagram. Um, I'm currently doing a couple of series, if you like. Um, didn't intend to, it just naturally happened. Um, Grayson's Art Club um, became a, a real obsession a few, uh, a few months ago. And um, uh, every week I was, uh, for, the last, for I think the th third week onwards I was um, submitting a piece of work and I was doing it at night after being after teaching all day on the computer I was then on the computer all night doing these doing these pieces and getting them in like right before a deadline which made me feel like a student and um, <laughs> it gave me a lot of empathy and um, yeah um, so I, I, I did these pieces and then the last of those briefs was um, was Britain and I'd done these really lovely, um, reflective, personal pieces about my son. And all of the pieces were gentle and humorous and whimsical. And then Britain, like instantly, my wife and I just went, oh, <laughs> we, we got so kind of worked up with everything that was happening in politics, um, everything that's been happening in terms of the, the, the management or arguably mismanagement of the of the pandemic response in this country um and, I sp and we spent a week the two of us we collaborated on it just you know really brainstorming ideas and then i was just doing these very quick images that i turned into repeat pattern and then the idea was that i, I then created a, a concept dress and it was a two meter crinoline um dress hoop skirt for Grayson Perry to wear as his alter ego Claire so that when we're in the possibly post COVID-19 world when um when Claire does arrive at their uh, the exhibition um that, that they're still sort of prepared for this social distancing thing and the, the repeat patterns would be tiered almost like this enormous cake um, so I'll make sure I put that on the website because I didn't ever share the, the dress. I did share the repeat patterns and some of them are quite savage and um, things like pick for Britain, um, the, the concept the, or the, the, the government scheme that was bandied around a few weeks ago. Um, I, I put a piece on um, about pick for Britain and I got called a racist because um, someone, had, um, someone had really mistaken what I was saying as being um, anti-immigration when actually what I was saying was pro-migrant worker and pro-workers' rights, but also it was mainly about um, 
the food standards that are currently in the UK being um, being uh, sort of reduced and 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 we've got the Tim Tams thing since and all of this nonsense. Um, and and yeah, I got I got like you know someone screaming at me on on Instagram calling me a racist, which I found really devastating because I'm I'm you know I'm maybe a lot of things, but I'm definitely not a racist. I'm really and, uh, in between, like... very, very aware of of how these things come across, and so I you know I tried to um, talk to this person, and and they just didn't want to hear it, and and I ended up having to block her. First time I've ever had to block someone. It was a new, what uh, welcome to the twenty first century for Adam, I suppose. Um, but yeah, so this is really quite sarcastic um, series on there, so satirical stuff dealing with with um, with the COVID response. And then on the other side of that, and and um, there's there's a different series that started, and it's something that I do want to keep doing. Um, so because of the black lives matter um movement and this 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 moment that's happening of of reflection and it, i hope it's not a moment as 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 they say um, um i started to produce some work initially using quotes from james baldwin the writer because i didn't have the words myself um and i just started to create artwork with uh, images of um sort of civil rights um uh, in the 60s um, and then sort of freewheelingly sort of reflectively just coming to um, learn a little bit here and there look into something I didn't know about um, and it's been because because there's a lot of stuff on social media at the moment about you know um, donate to charities or teach yourself or do this stuff I thought well I don't have a lot of money but what I do have is is a platform as an educator so um, I can teach myself, I can learn, but then I can also hopefully bring that into the classroom at some point in the future. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a really quite, like I say, freewheeling sort of thing. I've, I've talked about Zoe Saldana and, and media representation. I've talked about Nichelle Nichols because it, Star Trek's always quite close to the front of my brain. Um, and um, and it's, basically, it's, it's a very earnest piece. So... The, the, the difficulty, I suppose, if someone looked at the Instagram um, feed would be, oh, there's a really sarcastic piece about British politics and then there's a really earnest piece and hopefully they don't get confused with the tone of voice mm. um, and, and the, you know, the intention there. Um, but yeah, um, on, my, on my website that I did mention, adampaxman.com, there are links to blogs. Um, I'll be taking one of the blogs down as soon as I've, uh, or stripping it back as soon as I'm able to create it as that um, publishing on demand book um, to monetize something because, uh, you know, I've, I've never really made any money and I've heard it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a terrible capitalist. I'd have probably done very well in the USSR, I think. Um, but um, yeah, so that's where you can find me. That's, that's me. Sorry for the very long answer. <laughs> <laughs> the last piece of advice you'd like to leave us with um yeah i was do you know what i had a this is ridiculous this is my anxiety right i've been sleeping like a baby during lockdown and um and then last night i had a sleepless night and my brain was just working and working and working thinking of not deliberately not on like the top sort of level of consciousness just working away at what you know what are the answers to this going to be and i was like no i'm just going to answer it as it comes you know and and and, and if i've missed something it doesn't matter otherwise the podcast will be 10 hours long and um the extended edition and um and yeah so i was like i probably at 3 a.m or 4 a.m had a really really clever articulate uh, answer to to this but um I think for design educators right now, you and I, when we were talking before we started the recording, we were talking about obviously the pandemic has, has, has fundamentally altered um, every sort of stratum of, of society and, and, and it, it's having lasting effects on culture, movies, all of these different things. Um, and education um, is going to have to adapt. Um, I've been working digitally, uh, remotely from home 
uh, since I think March. Um, and for the most part, when I'm with the students, I've loved it. Um, I've tried to be really positive, a real cheerleader, really like try and look out for their um, mental health. Um, I was brought to tears. It was a, a student telling me, a mature student telling me that her son was being bullied uh, before all this. Um, and it had somehow, presumably, through cyberbullying continued into lockdown. And then she was trying to deal with all of her university work on top of it. You know, all of this pastoral um, stuff. Um, and I think that's a really value. Again, empathy, it comes down to empathy. But um, for educators, I think someone needs to say, um, you, you know, well done. You're doing a good job. Just do your best. It's not possible i mean right now i've had to send my infant son out in the not quite raining but not very nice looking day with my wife because otherwise he'd have been scampering around on his mat playing around and, and shouting at, at me because I've, I've turned my back on him and um, so juggling childcare um and a marriage and um chores and not being able to see my family um on anything other than a, you know video calls for months um i'm i'm well aware that people are dealing with worse i'm, I'm well aware that a lot of people are dealing with similar um and i think it's just important to know that um this could be around for a long time and we need to adapt and i think managers need to adapt and not think that business as usual is is a model that's gonna gonna work because it, we're just gonna burn out like cheap light bulbs and you know they're going to have to try and replace us. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a difficult time, and it's okay to not you know be super happy and great every single day. Um, I think I think that that's the most relevant thing I can maybe say at the moment. It's maybe not as you know, but maybe in two years it'll it'll seem like ancient history, and and uh, hope well, you know. Uh, but maybe in two years, the new normal will be properly fixed in and, and we'll have had some changes. And I, I certainly hope that, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement has, has made some serious headway um, around the world. Um, been very worried by a lot of the uh, racist stuff that's been happening in Yorkshire, where I'm originally from, uh, with people being run out of town, essentially, um, sort of almost like a end of a frankenstein movie um terrible 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 thing um and the, the world is very complicated at the moment but um design endures or design is for you know a, a fraction of a second as you drive past in a in a car um design's a wonderful thing and i actually the thing i'll leave you with the thing the thing i'll leave people with and, and for students as well one of the most successful sessions i did this year um uh, was uh, a, a lecture and it got completely derailed because my makeup students came in. They'd been doing an a practical assessment and some of them were quite dejected. I think they thought they hadn't done very well. And um, they said, oh, we've got a lot of deadlines on. We're really sorry we're late. And everything. I said, it's okay. Just, you know, sit down. We'll, this is what we're doing. And, and then I said, right, what I'd now like everyone to do, I'll give you some post-it notes. Uh, this is the great shame of, of virtual teaching because there's you know post-it notes you can't physically hand people post-it notes you've got to be two meters away at least and throw them out uh health and safety it's a nightmare and um so what happened was i said i want everyone to just take a moment take a little bit of time take five ten minutes i'll run and make a cup of tea it's always an excuse to make a cup of tea um and just write down why you love design right now um, and if you don't love design right now, just write why you why you don't love design right now on a post-it note. It, it's just a simple thing. And we sat and we chatted. I chatted with some of the others, but that particular group that had been, been having a practical assessment, they stayed for about half an hour, 40 minutes later than, than the session um, into whatever else, admin, something I was supposed to be doing at that point. Um, and we just chatted and we chatted in a really informal way. And um, they said, that is one of the most useful things we've done because we forget like why we're here. 
mm. while we're at university. Mm. Um, and it sort of refocused, maybe refocused them. I said, it's something that you will get strained and it will get challenged. It'll get stretched. It'll snap sometimes. Um, but, you know, design is a love affair that can last a, last, last a lifetime. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so no, much. thank you. <laughs> See you soon. All the best. Bye. Thank you very much indeed.